Welcome to Calvary Albuquerque. We pursue the God who is passionately pursuing a lost world. We do this with one another. Through worship, by the word, to the world. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 13, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, to Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, for a message that I've titled, The Heat of Temptation. But as we approach such a heavy subject, and as I acknowledge that there's a lot of people in this room right now who have their own set of temptations, their own set of struggles, their own set of sins, I'm going to say a prayer, not just over the text that we're going to be sharing tonight, but also over each one of us individually, that God would give you the strength to combat and to fight the temptations in your life. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Lord God, we come before you right now, Lord, believing that you have something to speak to us tonight. Lord, not believing that I have something to share, that I have something to speak, but that you have something to speak, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has something to share, that you will do the work of opening our hearts and our minds to receive these truths and apply these truths. And so, Lord, I pray right now that as your word goes out, it would not return void as you promised, God. Lord, I pray for each individual person in this room for the struggles that they're experiencing, the temptation that they're combating, Lord, maybe a temptation to commit adultery, a temptation to consume alcohol, a temptation to do drugs, a temptation to cheat, to lie, to steal, a temptation to look at pornography, a temptation, Lord, to hang out with the wrong crowd, to be in a relationship they know they shouldn't be in. Lord, whatever the temptation is, God, I pray that you would break through the strongholds, that you would silence the liar, and that tonight we would raise our banner Jesus Christ over those sins and those strongholds. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone who agreed said, amen. amen, amen. You know, temptation, as we talked about, is something we don't like to talk about a whole lot. We don't like to admit that we're tempted, and that's why I think it's important, before we even start with this, that we did that, 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 that little exercise, if you will, of acknowledging, of raising our hands, releasing those temptations, releasing those strongholds, realizing they're there. Because when someone asks you, hey, are you tempted to sin, your first inclination is, no, no, I'm good. Right? No one wants to admit their temptations. You probably don't want the person next to you to know what it is you're tempted to do. That brings shame. That brings embarrassment for people to know our struggles, to know our temptations. And yet, I believe that temptations is one of the primary ways that we feel the heat in society. You know, this series has been all about the heat, the heat of life. And the fact that the heat can either melt you or make you. And maybe you don't relate to being thrown into a furnace uh, because you won't bow down to an idol. Maybe you don't relate being thrown into a lion's den because you refuse to stop praying. Maybe you don't relate to being swallowed by a giant fish because God told you to go 3,000 miles and preach the gospel and you said no. Maybe you don't relate to those things. Here's something you can relate to, temptation. Temptation. Here's something you can feel, and you probably feel on a daily basis, temptation. The desire to do what you know you shouldn't do. Paul summed it up best when he said, that which I want to do, I don't do. That which I do, I don't want to do. Hey, folks, that's temptation. The temptation to do what we know we shouldn't do. The temptation to not do what we know we should do. And so when we ask, will the heat melt you or make you, there is no place where this can be better seen than with temptation. Maybe this is going to be this finale, this, I guess you could say the end of summer heat. You know, it's been a great five weeks so far, and this is the last official message of summer heat. Next week, I'm going to do a message called, You're Dead. That's comforting, right? <laughs> But let me tell you, you're going to want to invite an unsaved person because the message of the gospel will be preached, an altar call will be given, and I promise you a lot of people are going to come into a relationship with Christ next Wednesday, and my hope and prayer is that your friend, your family member is one of them. But this is the last official end of summer heat. And so I think this is a great place to have our final takeaway this understanding, this realization that there is no place where the battle with the heat can be better seen than with temptation. 
And you know, we've actually seen it throughout the whole series with Rack, Shack, and Benny. They withstood temptation. With Daniel, he combated temptation. With Jonah, he gave in to temptation. The heat of temptation is one of the greatest struggles that we deal with in the Christian life. And your resolve to either melt or make it through the heat of temptation will determine your walk with Christ. Realize that. It will determine your walk with Christ. It will determine your relationship with Jesus Christ, your ability and your resolve to either melt or make it when the heat of temptation gets turned up in your life. When the heat of temptation comes rearing its teeth into your life. You know, wouldn't it be great if there was no temptation? Wouldn't that be fantastic? Or what if Satan was really stupid and he tempted us with things that we didn't really want to do? Like, don't you wish that, like, Satan tried to tempt you with things that you had no desire to do? No, but he's smart. He's cunning. We learned in the first week that he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's smart. He's cunning. He has strategy. He has tactic. He knows what you want to do. He knows what you don't want to do. And he knows all the ways to get you to do and not do those things. Everyone faces temptation in one way or another. As a matter of fact, I believe Christians face it even more. Christians have a bigger target on their back than non-Christians do. Look, it's not a big uh, win for Satan to get a guy who who, who has already had three divorces and has cheated on three wives to, to get him to cheat on another wife. That's not a big win for Satan, but it's a big win for Satan to get somebody who's in ministry, somebody who's serving the Lord, somebody who a lot of people look up to. It's a big win for him to get that person to fall. It's a bigger win for Satan to target a Christian and have a Christian sin and fall than it is for him to get someone in the world to fall. Temptation is so dangerous because temptation leads to sin and sin leads to death. This is gonna be the theme of our message next week. You're dead. You know, the Bible says that you're either dead in sin or you're dead to sin. You're dead. The choice is just which one are you? Are you dead in sin or are you dead to sin? Sin leads to death. And you need to understand tonight that you are incompatible with sin. You've got to get that on your radar. You, as a Christian, as a believer, as a child of God, you are incompatible with sin. Just like your iPhone is incompatible with water. Anyone ever drop their iPhone in the water? Do they play nice? No, they don't. Christian, you're incompatible with sin like your iPhone is incompatible with water. You're incompatible with sin like Pokemon Go is incompatible with cliffs. You're incompatible with sin like zebras are incompatible with lions. You're incompatible with sin like cars are incompatible with light poles. Christians are incompatible with sin. And yet it seems that many Christians, no matter how many times they fall, never really learn from it. You know, it's like the classic sports movie slogan, learn from your fall, learn from, learn from falling. And it's kind of like this classic football thing, like get up and, and learn from how terribly we did in the first half and let's do better in the second half, right? Well, it's one of those things that it seems like we as Christians, and, and when I say we as Christians, I mean we, because myself is included in this, that we never really learn from how we fall. We never really learn from how we struggle, from from the sins that plague us. And and what, what blows my mind about it is that when I ask you what you're tempted with, inevitably one thing pops in your mind because usually we're plagued with one major temptation in our lives. Now, now we sin in a lot of different areas. But usually there's one big thing, a big temptation, a big thing that causes you to fall. And it's kind of like your struggle. It's your burden to carry. And what's funny about that to me is that we know exactly the way that Satan's gonna attack. We know exactly the way that Satan wants to destroy us. We know exactly the foothold that he has in our life, which means we should be able to prepare for it. We should be able to set up roadblocks and build walls and build protection and safety in our lives to withstand it. And yet it seems like as Christians, so often we don't learn. We don't do what we know we should do, just like Paul said. 
And so when the temptation to do what we shouldn't do comes, we're ready and willing because we haven't done what we need to do to prepare us against temptation. Now you might say, no, nay, not me. (laughs) That might apply to you, and and I'm glad you're honest, and that might apply to the person next to me, but not me, I'm a good Christian. I grew up in the church. Look, it doesn't matter if you grew up in the church, if you go to church, or if you work for the church. Samson worked for the Lord, and he fell into sexual sin with Delilah. David worked for the Lord, and he murdered a man whose wife he knocked up. Peter worked for the Lord, and yet he denied Christ publicly. Just because you grew up in the church, go to church, or work at the church, doesn't mean you're exempt from temptation and sin. Actually, it just makes you a bigger target. So don't fool yourself and say, well, no, 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 not me. No, no, I I can withstand, I can do it. Because we all struggle with that temptation, we all struggle with that sin. And so the first step to recognizing how to combat it is to realize that it's there, to be honest and say, look, I struggle. And by the way, you know, when, when we were all raising our hands and say, yes, I struggle, I need victory over this sin in my life, Maybe after this, you could talk to the person who's sitting next to you and tell them what that struggle is and develop some accountability in your life. Because one of the best ways to combat temptation and sin is accountability. Having somebody talking to you and saying, hey, how are you doing with that sin that you shared with me last Wednesday? How are you, how are you doing combating that? How are you doing fighting that? Somebody who knows, somebody who can empathize, who can feel for you, who can feel with you. I think it's time as Christians, we stop hiding our struggles from each other and we start airing it out and saying, look, man, I struggle and this is what it is. Because until we're honest with each other, until we're honest with ourselves, we can't have true victory in our lives over those sins and those struggles. You know, it can seem so hard to effectively resist temptation because, well, it's temptation, right? (laughs) It's tempting, good is good, bad is bad, and temptation is tempting. And the effect of giving in to temptation will be absolutely devastating. By giving in to temptation, you can lose in a moment what it took a lifetime to gain. Remember one of the things we said the very first week is that the heat will define your legacy. How you respond to the heat will determine how the world remembers you. Again, nowhere this can be greater seen than in temptation. Think about how many Big pastors who have, who have been used to do incredible things, evangelists who have reached incredible heights and seen incredible fruit from their ministry have some temptation, whether the temptation of greed and they steal from the church or they do something dishonest with the way that they're, they're filtering money through the church or they commit adultery on their wives. We just found out Perry Noble just had to be removed from his church because he struggled with an alcohol addiction. But we see these things happen and in one moment, a lifetime of ministry, a lifetime of work, a legacy can be destroyed. Christian, your legacy is determined by how you respond to the heat of temptation. Maybe you say, well, I don't have as big of a platform. I don't have as big of a place in my life from which to fall. Well, it doesn't have to be the legacy that thousands and thousands of people know about your sin. Maybe it's, again, an adulterous relationship where you cheated on your husband or wife and the legacy isn't gonna reflect to thousands of people, but it's gonna reflect to your kids who are gonna grow up having a mom and a dad who are divorced and not having that marriage model that was intended by God to be in their lives. Maybe you don't have such a a far fall, but perhaps if you're lying and cheating and stealing, that legacy could mean that you wind up in jail for tax evasion or tax fraud or or theft, and, and you end up having a legacy that's left behind of a criminal who's no longer trusted, who can't get a good job, The heat will determine, will define your legacy no matter how high up or how low down you feel. So the question is, can temptation be resisted? You know, a lot of people ask me, hey, can temptation be escaped? Can I escape temptation? The answer is no. You can't escape temptation. 
but you can resist temptation. You can resist temptation. The Bible says temptation can and should be resisted. As a matter of fact, it promises a very special blessing to the person who does so. James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Church, did you know that testing and temptation can actually have a positive effect on your life? You realize that? You know, it's been said Christians are a lot like tea bags. You don't know what they're made of until you put them in hot water. I like that. I like that analogy. It works so well with what we've been talking about, summer heat. This has been the entire purpose of summer heat, to realize that the heat of the valley doesn't have to be a bad thing. The heat that God brings in your life, including temptation, doesn't have to be a bad thing because your response to the heat of pain, the heat of persecution, and the heat of temptation has the ability to make you, not just melt you. It has the ability to build up your legacy, not just tear it down. It has the ability to make you, not just break you. Remember we said the very first week to stop viewing the valleys and the heat as a burden, but to start viewing it as a blessing. Stop viewing the heat, stop viewing the valleys of life as a burden, and start viewing them as a blessing. Something to learn from, something to grow from. In the story before us, we see how Jesus himself faced temptation as a man to show us how it's done. I mentioned just a bit ago, my, one of my favorite verses, Hebrews chapter two, verse 18, in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He's able to aid those who are being tempted. How did the author of Hebrews know that? Because of this passage. Because of this passage where Jesus was tempted to sin. He was tempted to do what was wrong, and yet, He utilized resources that you and I can learn from to resist temptation. And so so tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little recap of some things that we've learned throughout this series. Has God taught anyone something throughout this series, something that you needed to hear, something that you needed to know and grow from in your life? Well, we're going to do a little recap and hopefully bring some takeaways as we close out this series of some things that you can remember, some things that you can hold on to, whether you're 15 or 50, hopefully there's something for you. Whether you've been a Christian for three months or 30 years, there's a truth that you need to hold on to and grab on to. And so we're going to do a little recap of what we've learned, as well as learning some new truths and practical ways to resist temptation. Let's read our text, Matthew chapter 3 starting in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I want you to notice something because we're not going to really touch on it, but I think it's important. Notice that it says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He was led by the Spirit to be tempted. That's interesting, and we're going to talk a bit more about that. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, so he was hungry, it says afterwards he was hungry, Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, 
he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. We're gonna see two things tonight, and, and it follows the heart of this series. Number one, we're gonna see summer refresh, and number two, we're gonna see summer heat. First, we see summer refresh. We see in Matthew chapter three, verse 13, after an eternity in heaven, after some 30 years of virtual obscurity on earth, Jesus comes publicly on the scene to begin his short earthly ministry. This is the moment when the ministry of Jesus begins. The public ministry of Jesus begins as he is baptized by John. All the other events leading up to this point were introductory, were preparatory. Bethlehem, Egypt, Nazareth, all of that was preparing him for this moment to be publicly shown into ministry. I also want to point out from this point, Jesus would have nowhere to call home. Up to this point, he had a home in, in, in Bethlehem for a short time, then Nazareth. He had a home with his parents. He was a skilled craftsman. He was a, a carpenter. And at this point, as he steps into his public ministry, from this point on until the day he dies, he will have no place to call home. Verse 13 says that he came to be baptized. Look at verse 13. It says, he came to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. So he comes to John and John immediately recognizes Jesus and it says that he doesn't wanna baptize him. It actually says that he tries to prevent him. And we might read that and say, well, that's weird. Why? Wouldn't it be an honor for John to have Jesus come and want to be baptized to him? Why would he want to prevent Jesus from being baptized? Well, think about what baptism is. We say it every month when we do a baptism. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward commitment. It's a symbolization that we are being washed from our sins, asking God to forgive us of our sins, repenting of our sins, and acknowledging that Jesus Christ is the way. And John knew that Jesus didn't need to take such a step. John knew that Jesus had no sin in him. John knew that Jesus didn't need to be washed of sin, didn't need to be forgiven of any sin. And John tells us that John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and said, behold the Lamb of God. That's what the book of John tells us, that he comes and he says, behold the Lamb of God. It was because John recognized the divinity of Jesus that he tried to prevent him. You know, the Greek word where it says he tried to prevent him, it literally means that he kept trying to prevent him. Think of it like this. It's like when, when you know your kid's doing something wrong and you try to come into their room and, and they don't just say, hey, don't come out of my room. They try to like do this little dance to get you to not get in the room. No, 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 no. No, you don't want to go in there. And they try to like stay between you and the object that they don't want you to see. They keep trying to prevent you. They're going to do everything they can to, to get you to not do what it is that you're about to do. You know, I think it's a kind of a funny analogy because Jesus is this perfect, sinless, spotless lamb and, and he's coming to identify and to kind of get in the mix with the sinners, to identify with the sinners which he was called to minister to. And John's like, no, 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 you don't want any part of this. No, 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 you, you're too good to be a part of this. You don't want any part of what it is that I'm doing here. These people... This act is an act of repentance. You don't need to repent. It represents an act of forgiveness. You don't need to be forgiven. He's trying to prevent him from being a part of this sinful circumstance. So why did Jesus want to undergo the process of water baptism? Well, I think most likely it was because he wanted to give an example of obedience to his followers. 
See, Jesus came into this world to identify with men. And to do that, he had to identify with sin. He didn't have to sin. I'm not saying he sinned, but he had to identify with man. That's why just after this, he goes into the desert to be tempted. He had to identify with you and I and say, look, what you're going through, I've gone through. I experienced it. I went through it, which means that I can be a help to you in a time of need. Again, Hebrews 2.18 isn't possible unless Jesus Christ identifies with us. The hope that we can get from that kind of a verse doesn't come without Jesus saying, look, I'm gonna identify with you as a human being, as a sinner. I'm gonna identify with you as someone who struggles with temptation. So he who was without sin submitted to a baptism designed for sinners. Remember we said in one of our first weeks that the little tests now can prepare us for the bigger tests later. I believe that this was that moment for Jesus. His obedience now made way for his obedience later. His obedience to God the Father to identify with sinners gave him the ability when Satan come and said, okay, let's put this to the test. Let's throw some temptation your way. If you really want to identify with sinners, this is what sinners struggle with. Right? It's one thing to identify with a sinner. It's another thing to be tempted to sin. His obedience here made way for his obedience later. A stand in a seemingly small area, remember, can prepare us for a far more difficult test in the future. We said the little tests, the little decisions that you make now determine your resolve to make the bigger decisions later. And we saw this with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We saw this with Daniel. We saw this with Jonah. We saw this in Psalm 23. The little decisions we make now make way for the bigger decisions we make later. So let's relate this to temptation. We started out talking about the things that you know you struggle with. Again, let's just see how many people are in here on us. This has been six weeks. I think we've got good participation Raise your hand if you know exactly what it is that you struggle with. Okay. So here's the test. This is how we put this into practice. If you know the ways in which you struggle, you know the foothold of sin that Satan has in your life, what little things are you doing right now to prepare you for when the big temptation comes your way? Man, right now you're in church, so, so the temptation's probably not knocking on the back door of your life. But when you get home tonight, maybe it will. On the way home from church, maybe it will. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, perhaps it will. Maybe it's when you're at work. Maybe it's a week from now. But what little things are you doing right now to prepare yourself for the big thing that's coming your way? If you know you struggle with that thing that you raised your hand up for, what are you doing to build up walls, barriers, to raise the banner of Jesus over that thing and say, Satan, I'm not gonna give you a foothold. I'm not gonna give you a stronghold in my life. You're a liar. And I'm not gonna allow you to do what it is you wanna do. What little things are you doing right now? Maybe you don't know what little things you can do. Man, this is where accountability comes in. Talk to your friend. Talk to somebody. Be honest with them. Tell them what you're struggling with. You know, I've seen how God providentially ordains people in our lives that when we talk to them and we're so scared to talk to them, we're so scared to be honest with them, God has provided providentially that the person we're talking to has struggled with the exact same thing. It's incredible how it works. So often I find that's what happened. Someone can relate, maybe not with exactly what you're going through, but on some level with what it is that you're dealing with. And maybe, well, you don't have those little things that you can do to prevent yourself from sinning. Maybe they will have those little things. They'll be able to give you some advice, give you some counsel, some wisdom of what you can do in your life to build up the walls against sin. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 of John chapter three says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And then verse 17, we have the famous verse where God declares from heaven, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is a rare glimpse in one passage of how the Trinity all works together. 
You know, there's some who point out that there is no mention of the Trinity within the Bible. The word is not used. Well, that's great, but the idea is. And so oftentimes when we have an idea in Scripture, and it doesn't have a name to it, we have to assign a name to it. The Bible, you know, doesn't use a lot of words that we've ascribed words to in the Bible to, to give an understanding, a human understanding of that. So although the term is not used, the teaching of it clearly is. God said, let us make man in our image. Who is our? The Trinity. And here we see them in action. But after this glorious experience, after this incredible refreshing experience, a time of very difficult testing follows. It was immediately after this moment of blessing that a time of difficulty came. After the dove was the devil. Now, again, a little throwback to what we talked about our very first week. Remember, times of greatest temptation often follow times of greatest triumph. As we learned the first week, sometimes after the still waters is a death valley, after a time of cool refreshment is a time of summer heat. Right after the father said, this is my beloved son, the devil was there. He was ready to put Jesus to the test. Remember what we said the first week, the devil always opposes those who God approves. Well, how do you know if God approves of you? Well, if you're a believer who's accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, who's been forgiven of your sin, and you're doing everything in your power to walk in sanctification, you can know that God approves of you. And so you can also know that the devil opposes you. So this is one of the first things. When we talk about what are the little things that you can do to prepare yourself? Well, first know the devil opposes me and God approves of me. That's the first step to really knowing how to combat sin and temptation. It is those who are obedient and well-pleasing to God who are the targets of Satan. And many times in our lives, the most difficult trials come after the greatest triumphs. And we've seen this throughout this whole series We see it all through scripture. David, after slaying Goliath, was met with praise from the people and a spear from Saul. Samson, after he destroyed 1,000 enemies, met a girl named Delilah. Peter, who stood boldly for Christ and hacked the ear off a soldier, later was ashamed to even acknowledge Jesus. Remember, our successes can cause us to feel invincible and let our guard down. So, Here's another way that you can tell if Satan might have a foothold in your life. Do you find that right now you're successful in ministry, you're successful in life? Maybe it feels like for once in your life everything's working out. You have a place in ministry, you're serving, you're being used, your family looks good, your relationship with your husband or wife is the best it's ever been. Your kids are well behaved, you've got a good job right now and life's just kind of feeling a little bit comfortable. Okay, get ready, be prepared, be watching, be waiting, because the devil opposes those who God approves, and Satan is waiting down the street, and he's waiting to come knock on your door and present some new sin, some temptation into your life, and all that you've built up, all that you've spent that time fortifying in your life, your marriage, your relationship with your kids, your job, your ministry, all of that could disappear with one wrong decision. All of that could go away, could be destroyed in a moment. What it took you a lifetime to build could disappear in a moment, so be ready. When temptation comes, be prepared for it. When temptation comes, be ready for it. Remember we talked about in our first week that the greatest sins and temptations come in the beginning and the end of the Christian life. And again, this is where I said, man, whether you're 15 or 50, hopefully there's a takeaway for you. Because maybe you've just come to know Jesus Christ. Maybe through this series, you came to know Jesus Christ. You need to be ready for that temptation because Satan doesn't want you to walk with God. Satan doesn't want you to get your life right. When you came forward and you said a prayer to accept Jesus Christ, that ticked him off. And he wants to do everything in his power to get you off that road, to isolate you from the body of Christ, to keep you away from the church. So be ready for that. And those of you who are in here who are seasoned in the Lord, Man, I think to a certain extent, even more so. 
be ready and prepared because again, if Satan can get you to fall in your last lap, the whole race can feel worthless. If Satan can get you to fall in the last lap, all those years of service, all those years of faithfulness can be discredited. So you know, it's important to not just run passionately, but run perspectively. Run with perspective. It's easy, especially in the last leg of the race, to focus on the finish line, be running so fast that all you're doing is tunnel vision, focusing on the finish line. But it's important to run with perspective as well because if you're just focusing on the finish line and you're not focusing on what's around you in your general vicinity, it's really easy to trip on the last leg of the race. It's really easy to fall. It's really easy to let someone who's running next to you bump into you and throw you off course. So don't just run passionately, run with perspective of what's around you, acknowledging that Satan wants to destroy you, acknowledging that Satan wants to scrape your dead body off of the pavement. This leads us to number two, summer heat. So summer refresh, we see this refreshing, triumphant moment where Jesus Christ is presented as the living God, and now we see summer heat. And here before us, Jesus shows us that temptation can be resisted and overcome. He modeled for us the way to deal with temptation. You know, I I wanna point something out because a lot of times we, we give Satan a little more credit than he deserves. Satan hits Jesus in a very predictable way. And I want you to know this in your life. Satan will always hit you in a very predictable way. Now, that doesn't make it any easier to deal with, but it will be predictable. It's really easy to look at your life and know the way in which he's going to hit you with temptation. Satan hits Jesus in an area of perceived vulnerability and need. I want you to write those two two things down. Vulnerability and need. If you're trying to look at where it is that Satan has a stronghold in your life, look at where you're vulnerable and look at where you have need. Chances are the way Satan will attack you is through one of those areas, a vulnerability or a need. Satan will size you up and he will hit you where he thinks he can bring you down. Again, often an area of need. You know, if you're rich, the temptation of stealing might not be there for you. You have everything you need, so there's not a temptation to steal. There's not a temptation to to cheat. But maybe you're wealthy, but you have a bad relationship with your wife because you work way too much. And so maybe instead of presenting you with the temptation to steal, he'll present you with the opportunity of a good-looking alternative because the relationship you have with your husband or wife just isn't cutting it anymore. He'll size you up and he'll hit you in an area of need and vulnerability. So be ready for that. Victory over temptation comes from being constantly prepared for temptation. Again, victory over temptation comes from being constantly prepared for temptation. Jesus said, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. So what was this first temptation all about? Well, It says that Satan comes to him and says, hey, turn that bread or turn that rock into a piece of bread. And it says right before that, that Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So keep in mind, Jesus was beyond famished at this state. And so Satan challenges him to use his powers for his own benefit by turning stone into bread. And the challenge was really this. Hey, Jesus, you know, just, uh, man, just 40 days ago, God said, this is my son whom I am well pleased. But man, he doesn't look like a very good father. If you haven't eaten in 40 days and 40 nights, he's not providing for your needs. He's not even providing for your basic need of food. You know, Jesus, it's time to take things into your own hands. The Father's not gonna help you. How can you trust him? Just feed yourself. The suggestion was really at its core this. God, 
has let you down. God has abandoned you. Now this same temptation was used successfully in the Garden of Eden. Remember when the devil said, God does not know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What it is is the temptation to judge our relationship with the Father, to judge his love towards us by our outward circumstances instead of by what he is doing inwardly within our hearts. And this really strikes at the root of our faith. It strikes at our dependence on God. It strikes at the promises of God. Remember one of the great promises we heard about in this series is that God's plans for you are of good, not of evil that you serve a God who is good, but also a God who is love. And so you can know that your loving father has plans for you that are good. And again, Satan is a liar. And so what's Satan gonna come in and do? He's gonna come in and say, God doesn't love you. He's gonna attack the two areas that God says he is, love and good. God doesn't love you. God's not good to you. Satan will attack directly the promises of God. Again, it's why I love that song. He breaks through the strongholds to silence the liar. You know, it's incredible to me that in this passage, two times Satan uses scripture to try to get Jesus to fall, to sin. Satan uses scripture. He quotes scripture to the God who inspired it. Again, Satan's a liar. You know, I have so many people that come to me and and have some verse to justify their sin. And they share with me some Bible verse spun and taken out of context and put into their own view and their own mindset to justify why they're sinning. And I look at it and I say, man, Satan's tricks haven't changed much in 2,000 years. He's still doing the same things. He's still using scripture, bringing scripture and lying, combating the truths, combating the truth of scripture. And so be ready for that. Be prepared for that. He was being tempted to doubt his father's words, his father's love, his father's provision. And I wanna point out, if he would have succeeded in doing this, it would have brought a rift within the Trinity. That's why it was so important that he not do this. We look at that and say, man, why is it a big deal? He's already fasted for 40 days. Can he just make some bread? He did it for 5,000 people, right? He took the loaves and the fish and he multiplied it. Why couldn't he do it for him to just have like a little snack pack, a little Lunchable? What's the big deal? (laughs) Well, the big deal isn't that he couldn't have bread, that bread was bad. The big deal was that if he did this, it would have struck a rift in the Trinity. It would have showed that he doubted the provision of his father in heaven, that he doubted who God said he was. And so it's important that he didn't do this. Now, I wanna point out another thing. These temptations grew in intensity. Here it was a temptation to take things into his own hands, saying God has let you down. Abraham and Sarah found out the folly of that kind of thinking, as did Jacob, to accomplish a good thing through questionable means. On that, Satan realizes that a little compromise today can mean a big one later. Again, here's the importance of why It's important to take the small tests, to ace the small test before you take the final exam. Just with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if they would have compromised a little bit and eaten of the king's delicacies and and done what they knew they shouldn't have done, that little compromise then would have made way for a much bigger compromise later. That little one lustful look that you don't think is a big deal can lead to an adulterous relationship. That one night stand can lead to a lifetime of regret. That one hit can lead to a chemical dependency and an addiction that can rock you for the rest of your life. And just so you know, it's always one of whatever it is. I always hear people say that. It's just one beer. It's just one joint. It's just one kiss. That one joint can lead to an overdose eventually. That one kiss that leads you to 
waking up feeling dirty and defiled, that one look that can lead you to being addicted and depressed in pornography. Because with sin, one is never enough. Because Satan doesn't want part of you, Satan wants all of you. Satan won't stop when you're down, Satan wants you dead. Satan won't stop when you fall, he doesn't want you to get back up. Satan won't stop when you look, he wants you to lust. And so know that one will never be enough. So when you fool yourself, when you tell yourself it's just one, don't believe that lie. Again, that's a lie from Satan. We're always better off to obey God and trust in his provision than to impatiently and selfishly provide for ourselves in ways that disobey or compromise his word. Look at verse six of Matthew chapter four. The temptation continues on. And it says, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So Satan takes Jesus to the pinnacle in the holy city in Jerusalem and he again uses scripture to challenge Jesus to see if he really is who he says he is. With that subtle and clever twist, Satan no doubt thought that he had backed Jesus up into a corner. In essence, this is what Satan was saying. You claim to be God's son. You claim to trust his word. Satan was saying, if so, then why don't you demonstrate your sonship? Why don't you prove the truth of God's word by putting him to a test? And, and not just a test, a scriptural test. The Bible says... So if what the Bible says is true, then, then show us, Jesus. Show us. If what the Bible says is true, here's your opportunity. If you won't use your own supernatural power, then let the Father use his. Again, Satan is a master at scripture twisting. And the only way to refute it is to be thoroughly saturated with what the Bible really teaches. The only way to combat Satan's twisting of scripture is to know what scripture actually says. This is why we always stress the importance of your own personal quiet time, your own personal reading of God's word. Don't just come to church and expect to get all that you need to know about scripture from this place. Study on your own. Study to show yourself approved. Read the word of God so that when Satan comes and brings you that little scripture twist, you can say, uh-uh, Satan. Again, you notice that Jesus did that. Jesus responds to Satan's twist of scripture with more, with more scripture. The Bible says that man cannot live on bread alone, but on the word of God. Again, Jesus had an answer for every lie that Satan had. And know that in your life too. For every lie that Satan tells, Jesus has an answer. For every lie that Satan whispers in your ear, hold the banner of the answer of Jesus. For every mistruth that Satan brings into your life, share the truth of the banner of Jesus within your life. Because for every lie that Satan has, Jesus has the truth. Look at verse eight through 10. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Satan now, at this point, drops his pretense takes off his mask, which really the mask he was trying to do was, hey, you're God and, and I believe you, but they don't. So show us that you're God. Use your power. Show us that you are who you say you are. And, and all the while, Satan has an ulterior motive. He always does. He really has something else that he wants. And at this point, he finally drops his mask, drops his pretense, and he shows his cards. He shows his real goal. 
He comes up front with his objective. And what is his objective? To be worshiped. To be worshiped. That has always been the objective of Satan. It says that when Satan fell, his response was that I will become like the most high God. He wanted a place of prominence. He wasn't content with being a worshiper. He wanted to be worshiped. He wanted to be the object of people's adoration and affection. And so he had first suggested what Jesus ought to do for himself. Then he suggested what the Father ought to do for Jesus. And now he suggests what Satan could do for Jesus. He says, Jesus, look, this is what you can do for yourself, and that doesn't work. Satan, look what God could do for you. And then finally he says, hey, let me tell you what I can do for you. I know why you came. The reason you came to this earth was to save all of this, was to save all these people, all the kingdoms, all the people. That's why you came. And guess what? I'll give it to you. I'll give it all to you. I'll give you everything you want, everything that you came here for. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. All you have to do is compromise a little bit. In offering all the kingdoms of the world, Satan was in essence offering on a silver platter exactly what Jesus came to do, to purchase back which he had lost in the garden. But God's method of doing that in fulfillment of countless types and signs pointing to it throughout the scripture was to be the death on the cross. That was the ordained way in which this was supposed to happen as prophesied for thousands of years. But Satan was offering the world to Jesus on his own corrupt terms, not on God's. And I see this happen in your life and my life as well. You have a promise from God and you hold that promise and you believe that promise to be true and somewhere along the way, you get this alternate route to accomplish that promise. Not by the means for which God wants you to do it, but by your own means, really by the devil's means. He offers you on a silver platter a way to get everything you want really quick, instant gratification. Not in God's timing, not in God's will, in your will. But with Satan, there's always strings attached. That which the father promised to the son for his righteous obedience, Satan offered to the son in exchange for his unrighteous disobedience. Travel now, pay later. Remember what we said when we looked at Jonah? That nothing is ever free with sin. There's always a price. There's always a price for sin. For Jesus, the price was worship. For Samson, the price was his strength and his eyes. For David, the cost was his son and his testimony. For Judas, the cost was eternity. But the thing is that Satan will never tell you the cost of your sin before you do it. You'll find out after. He won't tell you that the cost of sex and lust is emptiness and a lack of self-worth. He'll let you find that out for yourself. He won't tell you that the cost of addiction is helplessness and slavery. He won't tell you that the ultimate cost of your sin is your eternity. He'll let you find that out on judgment day. That's the essence of how Satan always operates. Remember, he promised Eve that by eating of the forbidden fruit, she would not die as God had warned, but that in fact she would become a God herself. Remember, he said, for God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be opened, knowing good and evil. He tempts us. Why set your standards so high? Don't be a prude. Don't be so legalistic. You can get what you want by cutting a corner here, by shading the truth here. And this same temptation, no doubt, came to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just bow. Just bow, just like Jesus, just bow. You don't have to mean it, just do it. And yet they knew that it would be denying the Lord or Daniel knowing that if he prayed as before, his fate could be death. Man, better to face that than to compromise. Compromise is the most lethal of satanic traps and perhaps Satan's most effective tool. Just lowering your guard a little bit. Dropping your standard only a notch. It's a temptation to lower our standard in order to extend our reach. It's a sin to danger our integrity in order to enlarge our influence. 
It's a sin to endanger our integrity in order to enlarge our influence. And it starts with compromise. Again, Satan's smart. He's not going to come to you and say, hey, do you want a life of misery and pain? (laughs) Hey, do you want to get a sexually transmitted disease? Hey, do you want to be addicted to drugs? He doesn't do that. He, He just brings a little compromise. Yeah, just go out with your friends for a few drinks. Just have one more than you know you should. Just just text that girl who gave you her phone number. Just correspond with that person that you know is a bad influence in your life. But Jesus met Satan on ground that you and I can occupy. He resisted Satan's varied attempts and so can we. May God help you to be a true believer, to trust his word, to not be sidetracked by the enemy of your souls. May God help you to run your spiritual life not on cruise control, but rather to finish your race. May God help all of us to resist the subtle yet powerful trap of compromise. If you truly believe in Jesus and understand the effects of sin, that belief will inevitably lead to sanctification and holiness, or as John says, walking in the light. But the opposite is also true. If your belief is false, your life will be marked not by righteousness, but by sin you'll continually find yourself taking one step forward and two steps back. You will, as John says, be walking in darkness. And friends, the light has no fellowship with the darkness. Again, the best way that you can combat temptation is to simply be a student of Scripture. You know, sometimes the answer is so simple. Sometimes the best way to not do what's wrong is to just do what's right. Again, what do they say in in football? The best defense is a good offense. I found the same to be true with our relationship with God. If we sit in cruise control and we're not doing what we're supposed to do, it's really easy for Satan to get us to do what we shouldn't do. But if we are doing on a daily basis what we should be doing, when Satan comes and tries to get us to do what we know we shouldn't do, it's a lot easier to say no because we're on a path with God and we found that it works. Satan occupied ground that you and I, Jesus occupied ground that you and I can occupy. Each response from Satan, each temptation from Satan was a response from scripture because he was rooted in the word. Christian, you and I need to be rooted in the word. And you might say, Nate, Man, I look at this and I hear this and I, and I hear about sin and I hear about temptation. I don't want to fall into temptation. And I have this little thing in my life and it's not a big deal. I don't think that it could really cause me to fall, to cause me to lose my legacy. How could this happen? How could this happen? How, how could Jonah's story happen to me? And my answer to you would just be this, slowly. How does it happen? It happens Slowly. Sin always starts slowly. First, it begins with apathy. Apathy with where God has you. Apathy for what he is doing. So the best way to fight apathy is with thankfulness. Be thankful for where God has you. Be thankful for what God is doing. Be thankful for where God is leading you. Then after apathy comes atrophy, the wasting away of your spiritual state where you're no longer doing what you're supposed to do. You're not reading the word of God. You're not walking with God and you develop atrophy. So the best way to combat atrophy is to be active, Be active in your faith. Be thankful and be active. Be doing what you're supposed to do. And then finally comes agony. The agony of being stuck in a state of sin. And man, the best way to fight agony, (laughs) I find is just with rejoicing, with joy. To be joyful in who God is. To be joyful in the truths of God's word. So where are you today? Where is your life today? Are you stuck in sin? Are you stuck in a state of temptation? Or are you like Jesus, combating that, using scripture and thriving in your spiritual walk? 
I challenge you, if you're stuck in sin, tonight, don't wait till you get home. Don't wait till next week when these truths have diminished from your life. But tonight, find someone, find a brother or sister in Christ, someone that you know. Tonight, tell them what you struggle with. Tell them what you're dealing with. Ask them to keep you accountable. Ask them to pray for you. And then the next step, go home and start reading your Bible every single day. I really believe this. If you do those two things, you're gonna find that the strongholds that Satan has in your life are gonna begin to diminish. If you read the word of God daily and have an active relationship with him and you have an active relationship of accountability with those around you, the sin strongholds in your life will be torn down and the banner of Jesus will be lifted high. Lord, we thank you for these truths. We thank you that we can occupy ground that you did, Lord. We thank you for Hebrews 2.18 in that you were tempted, you're able to aid us when we are tempted. And God, I pray for anyone in here who is tempted tonight, who is stuck in the stronghold of sin. Lord, I pray that you would help them to learn to resist that sin. Lord, I pray that you would help them to walk in the word, to read your word on a daily basis, to be ready in season and out of season, to be prepared and to ace the little tests so that when the big test comes their way, they're ready for it. And God, I pray that you would bring people in their life to keep them accountable, people to strengthen them, people to hold them up, help them to resist temptation effectively. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What binds us together is devotion to worshiping our Heavenly Father, dedication to studying His Word, and determination to proclaim our eternal hope in Jesus Christ. For more teachings from Calvary Albuquerque and Skip Heitzig, visit calvaryabq.org.